So we'd like to get our afternoon, uh, final afternoon panel underway. <clears throat> so, our panel this afternoon is Next Steps in Implementing Cognitive Remediation in BC. And our moderator is Monica McElduff, who is Vancouver Coastal Health Director for Vancouver for Mental Health and Substance Use. I work with Monica, and uh, she's an excellent leader, and uh, we're very privileged to have her this afternoon to moderate our panel. Monica. Thank you, Randall. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon and be asked to participate. And I don't know about you all, but I'm finding this very hopeful and looking forward to this next panel. And we will have lots of time for more questions and answers. Okay, so um, what we're going to be doing now is for this panel, it's about the implementation of CR. And we're actually going to start off watching a video around one comprehensive PSR program that has been built around a foundation of CR. And even tutoring. The Laurel House Supported Education Program received the highest rating from Connecticut's Department of Mental oh, Health and Addiction one. Services. That's when you press the left button to hit yes. To improve quality of life even further, Laurel House helps participants improve thinking skills. Thinking Well is an innovative, recognized program that works on cognitive impairment, typical in people living with mental illness. The program uses instructor-led computer-based drills to exercise the brain, strengthen cognition, and build confidence. Improvements are measurable, and positive functional outcomes are seen in successful job, school, and community engagement. You definitely need cognitive skills when you're organizing or planning anything in life. I mean, you're problem solving and thinking, you know, analytically. Then I discovered that I was able to transfer those skills over into my job. Those uh, programs really help me a lot, so it's awesome. Laurel House offers a number of other self-improvement programs that deepen connections to peers and to the community. Group meetings and workshops teach and build on life skills, learning to live healthy and staying well, strengthening one's own recovery by helping others in family and peer support groups, rushing over the rocks, Okay, thank you. All right, so I already mentioned that this panel is going to be around the introduction to the many components that go into the planning and development of cognitive remediation services. There will also be time for dis discussion among the panelists on these key issues, and uh, we'll have a chance to hear from the audience as well. Um, so first of all, we're going to hear from Dr. John Higginbottom, <laughs> clinical professor at UBC Department of Psychiatry, who has been instrumental for over 25 years in disseminating evidence-based practices such as assertive community treatment. We're also going to be hearing from Dr. Tom Eman again from the EPI Advanced Practice, who has played a key role in developing, implementing, and assessing early psychosis intervention programs in BC since 1999. Their presentation will first discuss CR as an evidence-based practice and then describe key implementation issues and finally ask a series of questions specific to the implementation of CR here in British Columbia. Thank you. So I'm sure by now I don't have to uh, convince you that... Uh, Cognitive remediation is an evidence-based practice, and I'm sure I don't have to convince you that this should be available uh, to people in our province who are in, uh, in uh, recovery. 
uh, it's what I would call an essential uh, tool for recovery. And um, it should be available. It should be available right <laughs> The problem is, and this is really kind of the elephant in the room, the mental health room, is the, the fact that in this country, um, even though we've known about um, this and other evidence-based practices being really effective and, and which should be available to people in recovery, we've been very, very slow uh, in, in adopting them across the country and certainly in, in B.C., um, um, and so there's been a very uneven uh, uptake of these evidence-based practices in BC. So I think we all have to be really determined by the time we leave here today that we're going to make sure that uh, cognitive remediation doesn't have the same fate as uh, some of the other best practices that have um, have been introduced to in the province in, in, in the past. So that's what this is all about. Uh, and even though it's uh, uh, late in the day and you've been exposed to a lot of information today, we hope you uh, recognize the fact that this is really, in some respects, probably the most Im important uh, uh, session of all because we're really focus on, going to focus on whether this is actually going to happen or not in BC and, and uh, become available to, to people. So um, despite uh, their demonstrated, demonstrated efficacy, the uptake of uh, uh, CR in the, in the field has been... Uh, uh, being slow. This is not a new problem. In fact, it's been characteristic of the introduction of other evidence-based practices, as I just said. And one of the real problems is the fact that there's very, very little literature on uh, the on what's important to effectively implement practice, new practices, and in particular evidence-based practices. There's very, very little. One of the um, most important articles is, is this one I've cited here, which is uh, uh, Drake, Bob Drake from. Uh, Dr. Bob Drake from uh, New Hampshire and uh, Gary Bond, some of you will know he's done some work in, in uh, BC uh, around ACT teams. And um, in their paper, the they 2009 paper, it said, for the last decade, a consensus has emerged regarding a set of evidence-based practices for schizophrenia that address symptom management and psychosocial functioning. Yet, surveys suggest the great majority of the population of individuals with schizophrenia do not receive evidence-based care. If you think it's any different in Canada, you're unfortunately mistaken. Um, we've got the same problem um, here as, as, the, as the problem uh, which occurred in, in the United States. Further to that, they, they concluded in the same paper that uh, the, you need, there needs to be a better alignment of mental health um, systems with evidence-based practices and payments. Now, they actually have a bit more leverage in, in the United States because they can, uh, with their managed uh, care systems, they can actually align payments uh, to, to, to practices out there, and that, in some cases, is good leverage. Uh, we don't have the same leverage uh, here. But I think the... Uh, the last sentence is really the important sentence here. The research community needs much greater attention to the implementation of effective services in order to improve the care uh, of schizophrenia in the United States, and I would say anywhere, basically. Um, and it gets into this whole area of what we call translational research. So we, we know what, what's effective. We know what really works out there. Uh, we've known in the case of some evidence-based practices like ACT teams, we've got over 50 years of, of, of solid uh, experience and uh, and uh, evidence to, to show the effectiveness of the, these practices. If we implemented these practices, we would uh, cut the, the emergency, psychiatric emergency uh, admissions by half at least. Uh, so why aren't we doing, why aren't we doing this? Uh, so let's, I think it's instructive, and uh, I don't want to get too much into the history of this, but uh, I think it's important to know that other air, um, Jurisdictions have grappled with this as, as well, particularly the United States. And uh, in 1998, they uh, convened a, a, a national panel of experts uh, convened by the Robert Wood Johnson. This is Johnson and Johnson ban bandages. Um, recommended that five uh, uh, evidence-based uh, psychosocial and systematic medication management practices be available in every community mental health center. So basically the same sort of thing that we're talking about. Uh, they had this vision for what should be available in the United States back in 1998. So their question was, how do we do this? And they launched this project called the National Evidence-Based uh, Practices uh, Implementation Project, really to dem disseminate uh, evidence-based practices. 
And a part of this was um, they, they decided that they needed to, uh, they, they actually had a, a, an interesting strategy, which I'm just going to say a little bit about, because I think it's one that we need to adopt actually here in, in Canada and, and certainly in BC. They, the, the basic strategy was that they felt that if everybody knew uh, about these practices and knew how effective these practices were, sort of what's happening here today in this, in this, in this room, um, Everybody in here, family members, people with lived experience, practitioners, administrators, you name it, decision makers. If everybody knows what practices are effective, then everybody will push for them. So, for example, if, you, if there's a new treatment for, uh, for cancer um, and the public becomes aware of it, everybody will push for that and it becomes available. Um, same thing has not happened in, 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 the mental, in the mental health world, unfortunately. So that was their overall strategy, and to that end, they developed these uh, toolkits, which were uh, written in video materials, including how to implement techniques, um, the, ac the actual evidence base, the key articles, which uh, were in such areas as ACT Team, supported employment, and so on, which were designed for all the key stakeholder groups. And again, the overall strategy was make to make everybody understand what is effective uh, so that they would go out and advocate for these, for these practices. Uh, the training consultation model pro provided support to all stakeholders with fidelity, monitoring, and, and, and feedback. So it, just to summarize, we, we, we need a strategy based on this uh, as well, which is based on previous experience implementing cognitive uh, remediation and, and evidence-based practices to make it cognitive remediation available within uh, the BC uh, mental health uh, service system. So what would be the critical success factors then of an effective strategy? How did we actually do this and, and make it happen in BC? So some of my ideas based on some of this little bit of literature that's been written in this area of uh, translational uh, research, uh, these are what I consider to be some critical success factors. The big one is leadership and vision. What we've really had a problem with in Canada and certainly in, in, in this province, uh, without stepping hopefully on anybody's toes here, um, is we've lacked a vision for what we want in a, in a mental health system. What do we want it to look like? Um, um, is it a recovery-oriented system? Are we using evidence-based practices? Uh, and, uh, and that vision also has to be accompanied by leadership. You need the leadership out there, at uh, champions within the ministry, the health authorities, who have a vision for making high-fidelity uh, cognitive remediation and other best practices, I would say, available for the people who need it. And again, it goes back to this basic principle. If you believe that people should have this available to them, then how do we, how do we make this happen? So that people wherever in the province can get access to these uh, services. Uh, education and training, this is a big part of the, of the issue as well. We need practitioners who've got this vision, uh, education, training, and enthusiasm. Some of this is happening right now. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, education is a major component here. We also, of course, need access to, to the technology to make this happen. And finally, we also need uh, uh, continuous quality improvement. We need, you can't improve that which you do not measure. Uh, some people talked about this a bit earlier. We have to measure what we're doing, which is called performance monitoring. Uh, what are the outcomes uh, when we provide services in mental health? We, some of us refer to mental health as a data-free zone. We just don't measure anything, uh, and uh, we, need to, we need to measure things. We need to measure outcomes in particular for people. Are people actually benefiting from these services that we're providing to them? And uh, uh, we need to do that, and we also need to uh, assure model fidelity. And that simply means that you, you stick to what the research shows works, okay? Don't drift. If, if, if an ACT team needs to have a 1 to 10 ratio, you don't try to implement it with a 1 to 20 ratio, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what we call model fidelity. So uh, over to Tom. Okay, me again. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next six or seven slides is really just try and set the table uh, for what the rest of the afternoon will be about, which is to uh, look at some of the issues that are important in terms of uh, how we're going to try and implement um, cognitive remediation in, in the British Columbia context and some of the challenges and just some of the things that we really need to think about. I don't think in the panel that we'll be able to get to all of these kinds of issues, but at least it, 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 I'll touch on them now so, so at least they've been uh, mentioned at one point. Uh, but before I start, it, it reminds me that we've had a lot of 
terminology going on today. So there's, you know, what's the difference between CBT versus CR versus metacognitive training? And, you know, in British Columbia, we call it early psychosis intervention or EPI. The other people call it first episode psychosis. So I want to try this one on for, for the people that, you know, aren't really that familiar with BC. So what do you call it when you have two days in a row of rain and storm and cloudy weather followed by a day of brilliant sunshine and warmth? Monday. <laughs> yeah. I told Alice, you know, you can't trust it. You gotta bring you know, you gotta bring a jacket. Um, okay, so uh, first up is uh, John was talking about leadership, so uh, some of this will be familiar to you all. But I just wanted to bring up the point that um, you know, first thing that has to be done is to, a, a need for this kind of service has to be demonstrated uh, to all kinds of different audiences, and in particular to to people who are decision making uh, positions. Uh, if you can make a value proposition that also includes an economic. Uh, value uh, to these kind of services, and that's really a bonus. Um, it's obvious that there has going to have to be quite a few partners, and these are going to have to be not just one time get on the bandwagon, but, uh, but ongoing partners, and that would include health authorities in our case, uh, NGOs. I see that there's a large uh, uh, presence here from places like Coast and 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 um, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, and uh, and the Ministry, uh, Ministry of Health in particular, and if other uh, ministries need to get involved, such as uh, childhood and family, that we have to have all those people at the table. It's obvious that there's going to have to be enough funding, that it's not just funding uh, a little pilot or something, but it's, it's, it's enough that it's a quality service that's being provided and it, that it's broad enough to, to cover uh, all the people that need it. And I think the last point is fairly important, that we have to think about you know, taking a model or adopting a model or, or maybe several, but th that's sufficiently standardized to facilitate the consistent and comprehensive implementation across different sites and across different regions of the province. This will not only help maintain uh, fidelity, but it will avoid a lot of problems that can happen with dilution, confusion, and the ev eventuating and poor outcomes. Um, so here's a couple of who and where questions. Uh, we started to talk about this a little bit this morning, like who benefits most from uh, cognitive remediation? Are there certain kinds of predictors around diagnosis or age? And how can they be best identified uh, by people, you know, by family members or, or by professionals? Um, and when we're going to start this, do we, you know, start by taking initial target groups? Um, which leads to, like, where's the best place that we should be delivering this? Uh, are there places that are going to be more optimal than others? Um, and we need to think about that before we just rush in and, and start doing it. Um, I think that dissemination can be either broad or it can start in certain kinds of hubs. You know, when you start in a hub, you can develop some kind of expertise and then diffuse the knowledge out from that, from that you know, sort of central bunch of hubs. Um, or you can go shotgun broad. And, you know, having been involved in rolling out early psychosis for almost 20, 18 years now, you know, I see that, you know, we made mistakes in the past and, and, uh, some, one of the issues was the way we initially brought it on board. So I'm going to urge that we're kind of thoughtful and cautious about this rather than just running in. So here's a couple of what questions. Firstly, let's not try and reinvent the wheel again. Um, there's lessons that we can learn from how this was implemented in other jurisdictions. We've got two people on the panel here who've done this in every continent but Antarctica, I think. Well, maybe not Africa yet. <laughs> right? Africa. You got Africa. Okay. You're, you're, you, the penguins need you now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're in Tunisia. Okay, great. So these people have a wealth of experience and we can learn from them. Um, the next point again, is just iterating what's been said, I think, in virtually every presentation, which is that services can't take the easy route and just sort of expect that if they download an internet program, you know, uh, on cognitive remediation and start doing that, that somehow magic is going to occur. But instead, that there's a lot of other elements that go into it. And, you know, I think Chris just published a paper on the use of role play as part of bridging. You know, so we, we need to make sure that we do this well and not just you know, in a simplistic and inefficient way. Um, 
There's the issue of integrating the various types of cognitive remediation, whether they should be offered separately, you know, how, how comprehensive these kinds of packages should be. Um, next, we have to think about outcomes. Um, what should a family member expect to see that is a sign that this is working? Uh, what kind of outcomes can we expect? Are, are some more important than others? I mean, it's easy to train people up to a task, uh, but what good is it if the task doesn't even translate to another test of the same function, much less whether that, you know, whether that um, relates to real-world functioning? So what are the important outcomes? And uh, what's the best way to monitor these outcomes, both at the individual level as well as at a service level? And we should be thinking about making sure we monitor these from multiple points of view as, you know, the rise in patient-reported outcomes has become even more significant within uh, health here. The staffing and training, you know, what are the different models of training? Um, how extensive is that training? Um, are there certain prerequisites that, you know, should be there? Uh, I'm sure we can get help with some of those questions from, from, from the panel. Um, and from an administrative point of view, you know, are there certain staffing and training issues that can either help or hinder uh, um, implementation? The, there's the issue of staffing. Each, you know, different professions have different kinds of expertise. And, uh, you know, is, is there an optimal kind of mix of these different forms of expertise that uh, will allow services to be uh, delivered not only efficiently but also most professionally, you know? And I think I'm just about done. In quality assurance, uh, there's been talk of fidelity, and fidelity, again, just refers to, you know, is the service or intervention that's being carried out faithful, right, to, to what it's supposed to do, right? So it says it's this, but is it really? And so that's a kind of a process uh, evaluation. You know, you want to evaluate what the processes are, uh, as well as the kind of end outcomes. So in order to help maintain fidelity, people do things like they write <clears throat> practice guidelines or they set benchmarks um, or they, you know, engage in things like site visits and manualize or semi-standardize the, the treatment itself. So people are, you know, running off in 20 different directions at once. Um, measuring outcomes is really important because it helps uh, feedback into the service about what's working, what's not working, whether you're getting the outcomes, and if not, why not, and what do you have to change? And finally, there's the issue of uh, integrating research activities into sites, and I think that this is a really great thing to do if you can. In my experience, um, in all kinds of settings, from hospitals to HIV to, you know, um, general wards in hospitals, um, that when you have research embedded, it, you know, it ups the game and it even ups the quality of the clinical service that's provided. And my last slide is just a couple of clinical questions that, you know, there'll be probably more uh, for the panel. Uh, these are two uh, questions that I, I, I just wanted to ask. One was uh, around this issue of uh, how do you increase <clears throat> motivation, you know, increase in intrinsic motivation, uh, and what about negative symptoms or substance use as, as barriers to successfully engaging in in or benefiting from uh, uh, CR. And then lastly, the issue of how can families help in this whole sort of process, both, both to support their, their, their kids or it, it, who are doing uh, cardio remediation and also how they can act as advocates for this. So that's just set, sort of setting the stage and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, panel, for participating in this next piece of, uh, of the conference. And I won't be introducing all the panel members again, so please refer to your package. And uh, when we get to questions from the audience later, you can direct them specifically to their area of expertise. So going back to um, Tom's uh, questions that he had there, one of the first questions are around the comment about not reinventing the wheel. Can people comment on their experiences rolling out CR in places besides New York and what kind of issues they encountered? Example, Chris in Ontario, maybe Alice in Europe. Who would like to go first? And I would like to add, is there any areas that it's okay to keep going in the wheel <laughs> and invent something new? Yeah. Um, I, well, first of all, I think it's always wonderful to be uh, to be creative and to improve on what there is. 
But in terms of the uh, challenges of implementation, I, I think the, um, the biggest challenge is simply um, increasing awareness about cognition across all of the stakeholder groups. Um, and, the, and, and so you really need to have mechanisms in place to, to provide that kind of education wherever you do this. Um, otherwise, you will not have a referral base, and you will be um, dedicating resources to create a service that won't be used. So um, that, that's really where it all has to start, wherever you do this. Um, and um, in terms of the implementation, I, I guess I would really like to leave people with an understanding that, number one, this is not an expensive treatment. It's really incredibly cheap to provide it, um, number one. Number two, it's, it's not difficult to implement. You know, it takes time. Uh, but there are ready-made packages out there, um, inclusive of quality assurance monitoring, built in, full, ready-made ready packages for training people. So it's not terribly difficult to do, um, as long as the systems are, um, are ready to, to provide support. So the administration really does need to, to be there to provide support uh, for the various obstacles that come up, um, which really are not insurmountable, uh, but uh, it just takes some time and, and willingness to, to do it. So, I mean, those, those are really the key messages, not expensive and easy to do. And I, let me add one more thing, and it's really an intervention that's appropriate um, regardless of how symptomatic somebody is. So we see people all the time who are actively delusional and hallucinating, not a barrier to participating in treatment. It's really important that people understand that, too. Um, I think, you know, the question of whether we need to reinvent the wheel, I think there are lots of wheels that we haven't seen yet, and that's one of the issues, that there are people who we haven't yet had access to because they either don't want to participate in groups, they don't have the funding to be able to come in for an intervention. And I think that one of the wheels we need to explore and invent is how to reach those individuals who might have some of the barriers, negative symptoms, intrinsic motivation, but also you know, financial issues or uh, social anxiety, things that keep them from actually being in a group setting to participate in this intervention, which we know helps those who do show up. So finding, you know, not, not the standalone or uh, computerized cognitive training without therapist intervention, but using advancing technology. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a, a project now where we have um, a, a web-based forum that the, that the therapists monitor and provide feedback to participants. And our, the geographic catchment area of our Lynn in Kingston is bigger than Israel. So we have people who can't come into Kingston twice a week. They live in Bancroft, so it's four hours or so away to get into Kingston. So we can't do ABCR with these people as it's designed. And if we go from research laboratory to clinic to community, I think we have to think about harnessing our ability to use technology to reach people with either web-based opportunities for therapists to stay involved um, tele telehealth, uh, telemedicine mm -hmm. as well. So I, I think those are some of the, the barriers that I often think of. Not necessarily can we address the symptoms when people show up, but how do we reach people who don't show up because of symptoms? Thank you. And kind of building on that, I think Alice answered the question about who should be getting it. Is there any other comments around who should be receiving CR? As, as I've always implemented, it's really not designed for people who were born with, with um, um, a severe developmental disability. So it's, it, it's not designed for people. We usually have a cutoff, IQ cutoff of around 70. And the reason for that is that um, there are better approaches to help people who's, who were born with an IQ below 70. They're going to respond better to different interventions and I don't think that cognitive remediation is the most efficient or effective way to help those people make the functional outcome that they want. So, for example, for people with an IQ below 70 in New York State, what we try to do is um, to have them placed, you know, it's direct training and placement uh, 
whereas uh, for for other people um, with a, who are born with a higher IQ. So that's really one of the cutoffs um, is that baseline. Um, Just a practical question here. Mm-hmm. Um, the assessment, sorry, the assessment is, is uh, the neurocognitive assessment is fairly short, mm-hmm. right? And so how do you... How do we get? How do you get to an IQ test? Uh, Do you just do a short form, or? So, turns out that one of the best predictors. I'm sorry, I have to tell a little story. (laughs) Many, many, many years ago, a friend of mine was running the ER and the and in the emergency room. That if you if you're born with um, an IQ below 70, you get channeled into a different set of care. Um, So he said, Alice, how? Could you please tell me one question to ask so I can determine whether or not their IQ is below 70? <laughs> okay. It's a very short form. Yeah, it was a very, very short, short form. <laughs> um, anyway, um, we, we do a, a re, what's called a reading test. It takes about five minutes, and it's a, a quick and dirty way of, of getting uh, an idea about somebody's pre-morbid level of of cognitive functioning and that putting that together with kind of a history and asking questions about whether they receive services for developmentally disabled people, you're usually able to, yeah, okay. to get so there. Kind of... yeah. Okay. Another question that Tom had raised on his presentation, or what type of clinical outcomes are you looking for if someone's receiving CR? So, so the, uh, in terms of clinical outcomes, we're talking about the broad measurements of functioning as well as symptoms. I, I think that you know, we, we shouldn't overlook whether cognitive remediation might actually help some people with their symptoms. There's been a resurgent interest in trying to address these persistent positive symptoms with psychotherapies, um, either partial, people who are partial responders to medication or non-responders. And I think, I mean, it's never been a primary role of uh, uh, outcome variable in my studies to look at positive symptoms or, or even negative symptoms. There's a recent study that, uh, that was just uh, published by Matteo Cello looking at uh, the role of cognitive remediation in reducing some of the negative symptoms and thinking about that feedback of if cognition gets better, people might have more success participating in activities. If they're participating in more activities, that might help their cognition. And so that's the kind of feedback that we would help for, hope for. I also think it's important to think about the timing of your changes because, um, as, as I once heard somebody say at a conference, most of our trials are six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks if we're lucky. And if our outcome measures are functioning, they better not be getting married, returning to work, and graduating from university. So we've got to think about how likely is it that we see change in everyday outcomes during the course of our clinical trial as opposed to the development of some skills that are associated with better functioning in the short term. And then hopefully a couple of months later, changes in behavior start to occur and are uh, maintained over time. I think we have time for one more question from me. I, Go ahead, Alice. Can I just add, I mean, what, what, the way we decided to measure outcome ultimately in New York State was really simple. We ask, um, is the person more engaged in uh, activities in the clinic? And please give examples of, of what they're doing in the clinic in terms of accessing, for example, supportive employment, supportive education. And then we ask, is the person more engaged in activities outside of the clinic? And we look for you know, any evidence that that's happening. And those are the outcomes. So we call them recovery outcomes, because that's the purpose of the program, um, that we're looking for. Okay. Uh, there's, there's one thing I really wanted to make sure we kind of got to, which is uh, around training. Um, and I know that, you know, different jurisdictions have wildly different ideas uh, around training. So, like in France, they, they, they've developed this very comprehensive kind of uh, training uh, program. And, you know, for us in British Columbia, you know, there, there, there's a, a diversity of opinion around, you know, how much training uh, will be needed. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on, you know, the different types of training models and how extensive they are and whether there's some folks that um, do better as cognitive therapists or, co- or cognitive remediation therapists. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, so my, uh, you know, my research shows that people who have some specialized training in mental health services, um, 
uh, in the United States, it would be a mass, at least a master's level, tend to have better outcomes. Their clients have better outcomes. Um, I know from country to country that's going to vary, so I think the, the thing to look for is specialized training in mental health services. Um, in, in terms of, you know, how much training or what make, who makes a good clinician, a, a good clinician is somebody who loves to teach and who's a good teacher. Um, so who, anybody who is, is going to be motivating and a good teacher is probably going to be a good cognitive remediation therapist. If, they're, um, if you're combining that with somebody who has an understanding of mental illness, that's going to be great, good combination. Um, the other thing is somebody who likes doing this. If people enjoy what they're doing, they're going to transmit that pleasure to the people who they're working with. And not everybody's going to like doing cognitive remediation. It's just not for everyone. So, you know, that's something that I've always been very adamant about is that, it, you know, clinicians tend to like doing different things, and it should, should be a matter of choice. It shouldn't be forced upon people that they have to do cognitive remediation. Uh, in terms of how you train people, the movement um, has been toward uh, less and less in-person training, and I think it's, you know, it's very hard to know how much in-person training is needed, but most people would say at least one day of in-person training. We spend a lot of time on remote training, um, on just about cognition. And so I usually tell people it takes about six months of learning how, you know, to, to, to feel comfortable as a clinician doing this, but in that six months you're actually starting to work and doing the work. Because it, 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 like any, ther you know, any therapy, you learn by doing and having some supervision. In terms of the actual curriculum, there needs to be an understanding about cognition. There needs to be an understanding about cognitive remediation. There needs to be an understanding about the various specific tools that are used to treat cognition. There needs to be an understanding about the other factors that could impact cognition, sleep, diet, exercise, medications, for example. Um, so you want to have a more holistic understanding as well. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Yep. We're going to do an activity, and after the activity, you will have opportunities to ask your own questions to the panel. They will still be here. So I'd like to ask Regina to lead us through the next activity. So how are we feeling? A little bit energized, a little bit tired, excited? Yes. Yeah. Pardon me? No testing. No. What we thought is we really wanted to create a space for us to consider next steps. Many of us have been to conferences and we have great conversations in the moment, but we really wanted to walk away with some practical ideas for how to move forward. So we realize and appreciate that we've given you a lot of information today. I am deeply grateful to my colleagues who have given us a glimpse into their expertise. I think we have seen a really interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, and I think we also recognize um, how people receiving services and family members contribute to that journey for people. And as we try and engage people in their health and wellness, uh, just we would like to ask you a couple of questions that are in your evaluation sheet. And I'm just going to um, preface this with a couple of ideas. So in your evaluation sheet, we would like to in this um, next 15 minutes, and I'm going to get a two-minute warning, to ask us to consider together, um, on a scale of one to, to five, what extent do you think cognitive difficulties are impacting your family members or people you receive services uh, with mental illness and ability to move forward in their lives? The other idea is please describe some ways that you think cognitive losses are limiting people in living independently and uh, continue with their education. And we really would like to get to a place of asking ourselves, how do we want to move forward in a practical way? I feel that I'm very excited about what happened to today. There's lots to think about. There's lots to draw from in our expertise here in the city as well. We've heard from some great programmed people. 
um, about really what to do and what's practically out there. Um, we do want to say that this part of the conversation is not recorded, so this will be confidential, so that if you wish to do some disclosure, we ask you to pay attention to your own sense of confidentiality, um, but that we will uh, also collect these sheets from you at the end of today. Uh, I learned that we have somebody who's going to come and look at that and really just analyze some of those and be able to capture that information so that we have a better understanding of how this work imp uh, impacts your daily life. So please know that that too will be confidential. You feel free to put your name on there if you wish. Uh, but we just, we know that for some this is very sensitive material and we just want to treat it accordingly. I mentioned being very excited, and I think that some of us who've worked in, in mental health services for a little while, how about that, a little while, um, have, have really gone on the journey, I think, in some respects. I'm just going to call out some uh, wonderful people who have contributed to this work uh, that I know about. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation from EPI. Uh, if you hadn't had a chance to go visit them, I really encourage you. I know there are two people in the room. If you can just stand up just to make sure that that is, thank you very much, so people know who to look for. Uh, this is a program. <laughs> early prevention and intervention that's specifically around cognitive remediation. I do want to just also single out my colleague, uh, Alison McLean, who we, and we've been working together to mind just standing up so people see you as well. And again, Alison has done... <laughs> Some incredible work too with brain injury and uh, we've collaborated she and I in this room thinking about uh, what, a, what does cognitive remediation really mean for occupational therapists which is my background. Uh, Alison has uh, developed some amazing algorithms around uh, doing assessments and really thinking about interventions uh, much like what Chris was talking about earlier on today. So I just wanted to point out that there really is some expertise in the city there's some really great people that we've heard from from psychosis programs and just want to, you know, because sometimes it's easy to look at the deficits, I know that. But as we move forward, maybe we can consider our next steps, um, just thinking about it from that positive. So I've mentioned that this part is not recorded, and we invite you to maybe consider what you might do and maybe just share with us what you might do. I know it's hard to be put on the spot, uh, but if you can, and we do have people with microphones who will... Thank you. Uh, deliver the microphone to you. And maybe you can share something that struck you from today, something that you feel that you want to take a next step with. And, and just, I see already one hand, so thank you kindly. So it shows recording, just let them know that we're going to edit it out. Okay, so it is recording at the moment, but we, we are editing it out. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. So thank you to our mic handlers, if that's a term. Thank you. I did see a person just here in the front row, if that's okay. Please maybe bring the mic here. This was the first person who put up their hand. Thank you. So I'm going to get a two-minute warning. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, used to, I used to participate in partnership presentations with the Schizophrenia Society over years. I've been in the post-secondary system for 30 years as an instructor, and and found it very useful to go to, um, into nursing programs, into social work programs, into genetic studies programs, into counseling psychology programs. And I was always astonished how little awareness there was and how grateful the students were to actually hear the story of a family member and of a mental health consumer and how hungry they were for information and enlightenment. And what I'm thinking is that it, it sounds very useful to train people who are currently working in the mental health field uh, to provide that training, but then your next generation will, they, those people will retire. Uh, there's also the issue about setting people aside for this type of training, you know, and, and paying them. And what I would really like to see is that at the post-secondary level, um, this training gets incorporated and is mandatory in the curriculum of people who are future practitioners in the mental health field, for example, social work, you know, counseling psychology or, or recreational therapists, because I think then there is awareness cre created before people enter the field, right. and there could be support groups, you know, of community of practice where people who are providing 
this therapy are supporting each other or exchanging ideas how, what, about what works and what doesn't work. And I would really like to see that. I'm not sure. I mean, I could go to deans at, at the college where I used to work, but I think we all need to work on that so that future generations of practitioners will have more awareness. Thank you. So I think, thank you. I think what we really hear is that you are making a commitment to provide some education and have done so in the past, and then you have other ideas about educating future practitioners and current practitioners. And uh, I teach a little bit at the School of Occupational Therapy and Occupational Science here at UBC as well, and we are grateful to have family members, and I totally concur that that's a huge learning moment for, for students. Uh, so really appreciate that family voice. Thank you. Others? I wish to add. Thank you. Mike on the way. Thank you for your patience. I have a question as to how this would look in a rice paddy, because we live in the, <laughs> in the, in the north, right? And I do a lot of work. The, some of the best work that happens with people is on the land, whether you're at fish camp, you're gathering berries, you're doing whatever you do, ceremonial, sage, whatever. How does that look out in the fields without the computers? What do we do? So I've been recommended that maybe we save that question because it sounds like we have a time to speak about that, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lady in the front. I heard a lot of information and missed it, but okay, so I live outside of the Fraser Valley. When I go back to my hometown, who do I approach? Like, what's the best? Who's the best person to approach in bringing CR to our community? Is it a doctor, a social worker? Um, I'm not sure if you want to answer that. I'm looking at you because I think you might yeah, have something. Yeah, John or I could. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it depends. Uh, I'd say it depends um, where where your community is, but certainly who who yeah the Okanagan, uh, whoever provides mental health services, um, you know whether that's a, a, at the level of the mental health center, but I also I think that. That there's a big role for advocacy organizations, so consumer organizations like, the, you know, the, BC, the BCSS and the BCSS can make presentations to the health authorities and, and that kind of thing. Or, you know, I, I think that we could really benefit from, you know, having all kinds of people advocating at all kinds of levels. Yes. Um, so uh, I think at the very basic level would be, to, you know, talk to that manager of that yes. adult right. mental health service yes. in Kelowna or whatever. And that might be Anthony Neptune with Fraser Health Authority. He's just a wonderful person who's Anthony Neptune, uh, who's really a strong advocate for rehabilitation services. And E P T U N E, Anthony Neptune. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's my no, Irish the, accent. Yeah. I apologize. The, the, re- the references, uh, resources page that you've all been given. So when you speak to people in your community, uh, providers in your community, maybe you can give them that resources page so that they have an idea of what they could actually do. Um, and, and my advice is always to talk to everybody, uh-huh. not one person, but yeah. tell everyone. Yeah. Shout it out. Thank you. Um, the new government for British Columbia announced in September, I believe, that they're creating a new ministry called for the Ministry of Mental Health or something like that. Have you approached that ministry Regard or that minister for that ministry regarding cognitive re- remediation. Uh, so thanks very much for that question, a very timely question. We have a gentleman expert in the room who will speak to that at the end of the conference, and if I can hold on to that thought as well, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Maybe the lady in blue. Hi, I just have a very practical question. I live in Fraser Health. Fraser Health seems to have different funding than Coastal Health. So I'm curious, and I think that there needs to be uniformity in terms of funding for all the health authorities so that I don't always have to come to Vancouver for a mental health conference. And also that, um, you know, my, I, I'm aware of a lot more services in Vancouver for mental health than there are, seem to be in Fraser Health. So I have that very practical question. So I acknowledge the question. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm not sure what I have to offer. Maybe others have things to offer. Um, I, we're hoping that we're bringing everybody together in this journey. Um, health authorities are important decision makers in terms of how resources get spent and what kind of programs come to fruition. So your voice is important in that. Um, so I think we're hoping the same thing. That and did you, Two minutes. I have a two-minute. Two-minute. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not a question, it's a statement. And first I'll say very quickly, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you people who are working behind the scenes doing all this brilliant work that you do. And what I hear also is that we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough of everything that we need. And I just want to quickly tell you about a thing that happened in Maple Ridge this year. Um, I'm from Maple Ridge. And we had a thing called the Mad Hatter's Parade. And what it was about was changing the face of mental illness, changing the face of a person who has a mental illness, showing people that they're just moms, dads, brothers, sisters, kids, everyone. So we had a parade of hats. 1,500 people came to the first Mad Hatter's Parade. So I said last year, Maple Ridge, next year, the world. But, <laughs> but in May of next year, we're having it again in Maple Ridge. If anybody wants to know anything about it, please come and talk to me. But it was the Fairmont Hotel sponsored the, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and gave us enough food for 100 high teas, which oh we held under a huge, big top tent that was donated to us. The city gave us a grant the Downtown Business Association, all of the stores made hats and made uh, displays in their windows. From nothing, I just sort of decided, we have to make a noise. We can't just sit anymore and wait for people to give us money or give us resources. We have to start making a noise and being seen in a fun way. And just recently, and now I see people all over town who come and talk to me that were at the parade, um, and I just met somebody just recently at a function um, a person who works in the field of psychiatry and who has a diagnosed mental illness. Um, and he said that he didn't wear a hat and he sort of sat back and he had some tea and conversations with some people that didn't disclose who he was. But he said, I walked away from that feeling emotional about it and feeling something that I didn't understand. He said, I've been to lots of things to do with um, mental health and mental illness. And he said, I discovered when I thought about it, there was pride, pride of being who I was and that I belonged to this huge group of people that were all gathered having fun. There was music and there was balloons and there was all kinds of things. And we had a great big party being who we are, creative people. And so, so I, I, yeah. I guess I really celebrate that energy and that yeah. effort and thank you for, thank for you. bringing that change. I think also you bring a sensitive point insofar as that we are making changes, but there's still people who are feel the need to be silent. And so we have lots of work to do. So thank you for all that energy and all that work. I'm leaving you today really appreciative for a lot of things. I think what I hear is just this low barrier access to cognitive remediation services, and I hear a huge focus on function, on what is this intervention going to mean for people's daily lives. We have some important research studies that speak to activity participation for people who live with significant mental illness. And so what we know is that probably people um, who are in that place might be engaging in productive activities for two hours a day. And to me, that means we have an enormous amount of work. I think we heard today how the context of reduced cognitive um, opportunities for people and skills for people and learning for people can really impact that function. And I think that relates very much to what people do. We know that what people do relates to that sense of meaning in life and having a meaningful life. So thank you all for your wonderful participation today. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Um, she asked a question for you guys, and now you guys get a chance to ask a few more questions to the panel. If I could just please ask that you limit it to one question so we can try and get as many questions as possible. But we will go back to that other great question for the panel. How do you create it in a rice patty? <laughs> well, you know, that relates oh, just use them. to the issue, actually, that Chris was bringing up that... Um, to, to ask people to come to a clinic that may be hours and hours away is really not very feasible. 
So the key thing is to find the rice paddy that is accessible to a large group of people. Now, that might not be a rice paddy, but it might be a library. So I remember in Australia, another place where distances can be rather large. (laughs) So I've been involved in some work there. And um, so instead of having the cognitive remediation sessions held at clinics, we we would hold them... At, at wherever there was sort of a gathering place. So libraries became um, a, a place to do it. So that, that's kind of the general principle behind it, is to figure out what's accessible to people. The other general idea is to, to we, and we don't know it yet, is to what extent can people be doing this at home? Um, and to what extent do they need um, face-to-face? And, I, you know, first of all, I think that probably varies from person to person. I mean, think about yourselves. If I asked you to go out and learn Chinese, and, you know, to what extent would you need to have the Chinese teacher there? Or, you know, we go to the dentist, and they tell us to floss our teeth, and we do it for a week, right? And then we do it the week before we go back to the dentist. <laughs> so, and, but some of us are really great, and we do it the whole time, you know, between dental appointments. So... You know, people are different, and and so people need different amounts of human contact, and we need to understand better, you know, how to how to harness that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. So well, the so, comment was so, without the technology. How yeah. So it? in the actually in the rice patties, we repurposed um, computers that were being thrown out by the law firms, you know, or wherever companies that were like they were old computers, they didn't want them anymore, and then didn't use web-based programs, but used CD-based programs. Well, yeah. I mean, look, there are many different ways to address cognition, and you don't have to do computer-based programs. There are other things you can do. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, you know, you have to figure out what's going to work in your setting. And um, computers are one way to do it, but if it, it's not possible, we were able to do it in, in very remote areas, but if you can't do that, there are other things that you can do that don't require computers. So there is a question in the back corner over there. Thank you. Actually, just a, just a comment. Um, the North Shore Schizophrenia Society has the pleasure of um, uh, Dr. Todd Woodward joining us on uh, November 29th at the Hope Centre. We host our, our lectures there, and we've invited him to come and speak on this topic. And we intend to invite our MLA, uh, Jane Thorthwaite, who is the opposition leader for mental health and addiction, um, as well as our Vancouver Coastal Health representative. So we're going to get everybody in the room that we can possibly get in. And I hope you'll all come and join us as well. Thank you. There's a question over here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about getting the people in the room. And if there's a way to um, tag team research between the CRT and, and actually looking at what works to get them in the room. Because that seems to be like one of the huge um, challenges. To me, one of the big problems is that uh, the, to get in the room are the decision makers and the policy people uh, and... Uh, and this, the administrators, you've got to get the message through to them. It's part of the overall strategy of everybody has to understand the importance of doing this. And, and the clients, of course. Because for me, it's about my daughter getting her into the room. Yeah. 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 But often, uh, even if you get to the families and, and the people with lived experience and the practitioners in the room, often the missing ones are the administrators and the, and the policy and decision makers. And it's really, it's really great um, to, to see Monica here, for example, who is one of the decision makers and policy people. So that's what we need to get more in, into that audience because they're the ones ultimately who will decide where the resources are going to go. 
Maybe perhaps one strategy too in terms of helping getting feet in the room is, um, is just the, the peer support. So having, we heard today just about having people who were graduates come back and maybe speak about their experience. And um, as an OT, sometimes I think we're able to engage family members when you know, there's a wobbly time where somebody has difficulty getting a bus or getting, but just providing that support through family, through peer, uh, so that people understand the benefit of, of their participation. Maybe that helps. There's a question over there. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you all for coming. Um, this was my first exposure to this, and, well, I bought it. So um, <laughs> I'm a, a mental health outreach therapist. Uh, I work for uh, the JFSA, which is a small agency down on Broadway. Um, so I'm the only therapist working in the outreach program, um, and uh, I have a... I mainly use CBT and motivational interviewing and that kind of stuff, just the typical things. I'm currently looking at some DBT. Um, and my clients range from borderline to manic, or sorry, uh, major depressive disorder, like all, the whole spectrum. And so I can see definitely how this kind of therapy can be effective with them. Um, the thing is, though, I, my supervisor, he doesn't have this kind of training. Um, I don't have a master's, but I still do my work, and from, from what I can tell, it works, right? Um, I do have my own designations. I have an RPC, which is Registered Professional Counselor through the CPCA. Um, what I'm wondering is, how can I get some skills that I see are super effective um, in a kind of a quick and dirty way, like Alice was saying, that I can bring to my clients um, in, say, the next six months or so, um, if that's even possible, and do some work that can help them get the kind of well-being in their life that they're lacking. Because it's absolutely true that um, that missing piece is that cognition. You see people get in crisis, go to the hospital, get assessed, get stable, come back out in society because they have the supports in society, and the same thing happens again. I have three clients who are in the hospital right now who are suicidal, and it's just a revolving door. Um, so if there's... The question was how do we get that, the uh, knowledge and yeah. information as quick as possible for clinicians well, uh, like yourself? Certainly one quick and dirty way would be to use the Dealing with Psychosis Toolkit, you know, the, the toolkit that I presented on, the Dealing with Psychosis Toolkit, because that, that, that gives you some simple compensatory strategies and some ad ad adaption strategies that you can, you know, use and you could act as the support person uh, for, for that client. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's probably the easiest and simplest way to actually start, I, I would think. Was there any other comments from the panel from that, for that? Well, list? I mean, the toolkit is fabulous. And then also on the resources page that you were given, there are a number of resources that you could turn to um, the, the handbook for families. Yeah, that's a great resource. Is, um, a lot of, of providers have actually used that for in-service trainings. Um, so that's another kind of, I think the toolkit's a really great place to start. Yeah. And then well, the, uh, the, the toolkit was based on the family. <laughs> <laughs> on the handbook. So we and then the te it. Teach Recovery is a website where you can get lectures. And, and then there's plenty of manuals, you, you know, you can... Anyway, that page you were given of resources, good place to start. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and then we'll have to wrap up the Q&As. And it's actually just going to go over here. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I have a question. As a family member or caregiver for somebody who needs the uh, cognitive remediation services, what, what kind of, uh, I guess, experiences that Alice or somebody have has, say, what do, what do family members do to kind of uh, enhance that process? Uh, like, where do we learn about what, what our role should be during the process? That's what I'm interested in. It, it, in the handbook for family members, there's some very specific scenarios that tells you how to help your loved one who's in cognitive remediation when you're hanging out in the kitchen together. What, you know, so we, it, they're very specific guidelines for ways that family members can help in different settings. I 
think we actually the best to... book I know of for people who don't work, want help is I'm not sick and I don't need help. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much for all those great questions and for the panelists as well for your great answers and I think it's making us all more curious. Yes. <laughs> and can we thank Monica and all of these panelists?